This game is a masterpiece. If you want to learn something about positional chess, then you could do worse than study this in great detail. So we have Lasker against Capablanca, and this is game 10 from their World Championship match in 1921. If you haven't seen the, the uh, previous video, then do check that out. That was game five, which Capablanca won. And they had four draws, and then this 10th game was played. Um, a lot of people have been saying, well, were the match conditions rather unfair for Alaska? Um, you know, it was in a tropical climate. I mean, these were issues that were debated, you know, 100 years ago when this match was played. Um, well, personally, I think the main difference between the players was that Capablanca was really at the peak of his powers. And Alaska was waning. Capablanca was 32 years old. Alaska was 52 years old. In fact, I mean, thinking about the climate, they actually played in uh, the evenings. The sessions were played from 9 p.m. till 1 a.m. And um, Capablanca remarked afterwards, because there was a lot of discussion about this, that actually on several occasions they actually had to close the doors of the, the, uh, the building where they were playing, the casino where they were playing, um, because things got too cold. And that actually Kappa didn't like excessive heat either. So I'm not sure climate is really a factor. I think it was basically the age of the players. Anyway, let's take a look at this game. So d4 from Alaska, and it's a queen's gambit. So instead of accepting the gambit, black plays pawn to e6, supporting that pawn in the middle. And it's very orthodox, the bishop coming to g5. And here, instead of rook c1, which is the standard main line, uh, queen c2 was played. Well, also a pretty common move. Uh, they actually had roughly this in, in game 7, uh, with colours reversed. So c5, this, this is... The, the best move against queen c2. Um, just striking out at the center immediately. And remember, white's king is still in the middle. So I think c5 is a very logical move. Now, there are some very sharp variations with castles. I'll, I'll go into this afterwards. If you want to know more about the, the theory, I will cover that right at the end for those interested in queen's gambit theory. Rook d1. So, you know, that's more positional putting the rook opposite the queen, which came out to a5, and bishop d3, h6, and the bishop drops back to h4, c takes d4, e takes d4, and black exchanged on c4. So this is a very common outcome in the queen's gambit, that after these exchanges, white is left with an isolated queen's pawn. Now, there are pros and cons to that. It gives white more space. I think we can see that very clearly. And that means that you can go on the attack. This pawn provides protection for the knight coming to e5. And that is a wonderful outpost for the knight. And in combination with that bishop on b3, this is a very dangerous attacking position. Um, I mean, just coming back one move... I would actually prefer to play with black bishop c6 and then knight d5, aiming to exchange pieces as quickly as possible. But rook c8 played, knight e5, and bishop b5, rook e1. I mean, for me, this is just almost a, a perfect IQP position for white. The only thing is that white queen could perhaps be better placed. f3 would be absolutely perfect. Knight d5. And here is a moment where Lasker, I think, makes an error of judgment. As many commentators said afterwards, best to exchange on f6, exchange on d5, and put the queen on f5. And white does have some pressure here. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's playable for black, actually. If... 
one exchanges and puts the bishop back on c6. It's a little bit passive, but black can contest the e-file. Um, and, you know, maybe that queen can come here and look at these pawns. So it's, it's not too bad for black. Nevertheless, that's certainly the way for white to play. But Alaska took on d5 straight away. And after this, well, black is actually fine. Bishop came back to c6. Knight takes bishop, pawn takes. Now, I think this basically gives black more security. So the d5 square is very well protected. Black never needs to worry about pawn coming to d5. Pieces have been exchanged, so there's no pressure on the king side. That's very important. Um, but still, making something of this position is still requires a lot of effort. Rook attacks the queen. Queen b6. And here, straight away, one can see that if the queens were exchanged, then that's very nice for black. You'd be able to attack the d-pawn very easily. These pawns now together, that makes a big difference as well. So after queen b6, queen c2. So Alaska, I think, correctly drops the queen back. And now rook d8, putting pressure on the d-pawn. And here, Alaska played the knight back to e2, and that really is very passive. Um, others have said um, knight a4 is a better move, and yeah, I agree with that. I mean, Kasparov thinks that white should hold his own in this kind of position. But this is still not easy. This kind of position, obviously the knight is superb in the middle. Um, this knight at the side of the board, but black sometimes has the option to push this queen away. Um, th that still requires some very good defence from white. So yeah, already it's it's not that clear. But knight e2 played, defending the pawn on d4. Rook d5, excellent move. And here it's already not so easy. Um, you know, black is ready, if necessary, to triple the, the major pieces on the d-file. Um, this is not pleasant at all. So Alaska exchanged. But somehow, fixing the pawn structure like this makes life very easy for black. The queen attacked. Comes to d2 and knight f5. And already we can see what the issues are for white. You can see that the knight and the queen attack the pawn on d4. The move that you would really like to play here is rook c1, just to take the pressure off the c file. But of course, after the exchange, then the d-pawn drops. This is the problem. So here, because of the pressure on d4, white cannot exchange pieces. Now, here, I mean, I think the defence is already very, very difficult. Um, Alaska played pawn to b3. He said afterwards he thought he should have played g3, and I think that is a better move, but still a highly unpleasant position for white to play. b3. Now, Capablanca's next move, excellent. Tell you what, I'll have a little slurp tea, you have a little think, how do you play here with black? This is where Kappa turns on the style. Pawn to h5, excellent move. So that secures the knight on f5. So there's no g4. Not that g4 looks like a terribly good move anyway, but h5 just begins that process of claiming space on the king side, which actually has a big effect later on in the game. Um, and here, some recommended knight g3. As Kasparov points out, after this exchange, 
and Queen C7, this is also very unpleasant for white. But, you know, with those knights exchanged, I think it does give white greater drawing chances. There are basically better drawing chances in any rook and pawn end game, for example. But still a very unpleasant defence ahead for white with black controlling that C file. But yeah, I think knight g3 is definitely better. h3 played by Lasker. Not so good. h4 claims that space, secures the position of the knight on f5, stops the knight coming to g3. This is now a wonderful position for black. And still, rook c1 not possible. So basically, Lasker is just passive. And a Capablanca can just improve his position very gently before taking any decisive action. And now, okay, how, how do you make progress? Well, you carry out a minority attack. Very simple. Pawn to a5. So basically, black is going to isolate one of these pawns. And then there'll be two isolated pawns plus pressure on the king side as well. Let's not forget that because of this nice pawn advance on h4. And this is just a nightmare for white to defend. Queen's exchanged. So the Cabo has succeeded in, in creating two isolated pawns. Rook b6, let's tie white's pieces down to defending the pawns. So rook takes pawn threatened. If rook b2, then rook b4, and already one of the pawns drops, and that's fatal. So rook d3, and now the rook enters the position. So as I said, it's not just the fact that these two pawns are weak. It's also that the black rook has a chance to attack White's king and kingside pawns as well. This is really, really nasty with that pawn on h4, just cramping White's kingside pawns and also the king. You know, mate, mating nets can often appear in this kind of position. So Lasker lashed out with g4. But, well, let's have a look at knight c3 and let's see what happens. Rook c1. Threatening knight takes pawn. After this, well, in fact, you, we can be very crafty. We don't need to take that straight away. Rook b2 and rook b4. So this just maintains all the pressure, and then we're going to take that pawn, and, well, the b pawn will drop afterwards. So you can see, very unpleasant for white. Rook a6 just played. G4. And of course, we take en passant. And that means that now, well, the second rank has no cover at all. This knight is going to hop in here. Um, well, it's, it's dreadful. Rook a2. Rook c2. So you can see the king is cut on the second. And there's potential to, to take here. So the knight comes back. And now the knight swings round to c6. We're still looking here, but looking here as well. Knight d1. Rook b1. Very soon one of these pawns is going to drop. King e2. And there we go. Rook takes pawn. A little trick. If rook takes, then knight to fork gets the rook back. Incidentally, so, so king e2 allowed the trick. Let's just have a quick look at king e1. Obviously, that avoids the trick. But then knight a5. This is the point. The knight has swung all the way around. And this one drops. Um, I mean, some commentators suggested that this was perhaps a better way for Lasker to try to defend uh, because there are very few pawns on the board but objectively this this should just be lost um, notice black's pawns are perfect 
There is no weakness to attack there at all. Um, so, you know, this knight can still just kind of jump around, uh, you know, poking away at, at the enemy pawns here and creating new weaknesses, targeting new pawns uh, before black's king and pawns actually start creeping up the board. So, yeah, it, it's a lost position, basically. So it went king e2, rook takes pawn, king e3, and well, Laska declined to exchange, but just kept the pressure on. It's a good practical decision, basically. Just keeps white completely tied up. And such a frustrating game for white to play because there is nothing in black's position to attack. Now the next pawn comes up, g5. Notice at no point did Kappa advance these central pawns. That's the central core that really gives black such strength here. Reminds me, of course, of the French defence, where you see this a lot as well, where black chips around the edges at white's position, but maintains this strong central core in the position. G5, very nice. Just claims a little bit more ground. And maybe the king is going to advance here. G4 hits the knight, which bounces around into this wonderful square on E4. This is, this is all a consequence of advancing that H-pawn. And when the, the H-pawn exchanged, white had to recapture with the F-pawn, which meant that this square is available for black. And now this is a horrible move for Alaska to make. He played the king back to f1. Of course, he would not have relished playing that move. If king f3, then the rook comes down. And check. If king g2, then rook f2. And if king e3, then rook h1 wins the pawn and the game. You can see... <laughs> White pieces just tread on each other's toes and there is absolutely nothing that white can do to defend here. It's just tragic. So after this check, the king had to go backwards. Very unpleasant. Check again and once again, king goes back. So white's king is now caught on the back rank. And Kappa's having fun now. So... Got his pieces in the perfect positions, and now he can just gently advance his king and think what to do next. Okay, he played pawn to f6. So, I mean, I, I, of course, there are many ways to win this, but this is a very sound method to play the pawn to e5. Of course, having brought the king round first. But there is no rush. That's another good lesson when you, you have control. Don't rush it. Just let your opponent stew in his own juice. And very often they make weaknesses themselves in their own position. But just make sure everything is right before you advance. So here we go. Pawn to e5. Finally, Kappa strikes in the centre. Just creates past pawn, basically. And pawns exchanged. King c5. And now the deep pawn can advance. And here, Laska resigned. Um, yeah, total domination in the center. Wonderful. Well, let's see what might happen. Let's say rook d1. Knight check. King e1, rook g2, attacking the knight. And if the knight moves, rook e2 is checkmate. Total domination. Uh, and really, it is a masterpiece. Um, you might say that Lasca didn't defend very well. Fine. But still, this overall conception from black is absolutely wonderful. Um, 
So that was the 10th game. So after that, Capablanca was two games up. Remember, it was first to six wins, but the match would be stopped after 24 games. So plus two after 10 games. Well, Capablanca still had time to catch up. I'll let you know what happened in later games in further videos. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Ah, yes, theory. Let's come back to the beginning. I did say I was going to look at that. Um, so, normal Queen's Gambit. Remember that uh, Bishop f4 has taken over as the main line of the Queen's Gambit these days. Bishop g5 simply isn't seen that often at the highest levels, basically because it's too easy for black to exchange pieces. And these guys at the top understand how to uh, defend slightly worse positions very well. Uh, you know, technique has is so, so much better than, well, 100 years ago, basically. Uh, Queen c2 played in this game, and c5 is a good move. So here it's an important position. Um, so rook d1 was played. Castles, of course, is a critical move. Uh, the so-called Rubenstein variation. Um, in fact, I think black has, uh, well, probably three decent moves here. Queen a5 is often said to be the the, uh, the best move against castles queenside, and it's logical. One can also take on d4, and I quite like b6 as well just holding the position and playing bishop b7 because it takes some time uh, for white to, to unravel on the c-file. Um, you know, the queen and king are lined up perfectly. So if black gets the bishop out to b7 and rook c8, it's already a little bit uncomfortable for white. And I don't really see any particular attack for white on the other side of the board. So I think you know, castles used to be deemed as sort of quite a terrifying move. It's not that great. Uh, another move, c takes d5. You could say that this is, uh, well, one of the main lines, uh, but also not very dangerous for black. You could say that white has um, a very small advantage in positions like this. But so many pieces have been exchanged and, and black already has uh, a lot of freedom here. Bishop g4, rook c8. It's hard to make anything of that position for white. Uh, there was an Alekin Capablanca game from their match in 1927 that went like this. And, well, Alekin with white had absolutely nothing in this position. Uh, that ended in a draw very, very quickly. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, in the game, so uh, queen a5 was played by Kappa. Uh, that's okay, but one can also play h6 here. And in fact, there was a game between Carlsen and Yusupov. That's Magnus Carlsen. Um, played in 2008 that went like this. And in fact, Yusupov with black managed to develop and, well, pretty much equalised this position fairly easily. Uh, Carlson had a, you could say, a very slight advantage here, but basically black is fine. So there we go. Um, I hope you uh, got something from that theory. Um, if you want to know more about the Queen's Gambit, then do check out my repertoire for black with the Queen's Gambit declined. You can get that DVD or download from the chess base uh, online shop. Do check that out. So I'm very proud of my work there um, and you'll see the link down there in the description. Thanks for watching.